Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Find the streets across the way. On your team, all on the Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Well, and on the rolling. on the victory side yes we are on the victory side we've heard if you've been watching tv over the last uh, couple of days we've gone through the remembrance service which was very moving yesterday the 100th year celebration of uh, the armistice um remembrance services and and i know that kevin's going to speak a little bit later about that and this morning the uh the parade at the Cenotaph. And what moved me the most was the 10,000 people that were backed up right to Trafalgar Square mm. to actually, um, to actually uh, march past yeah. and to remember their fallen comrades. Uh, there was a gr one of the guys there who had retired and he wanted a, uh, his wife said, you've got to get a hobby, you can't stay in the house. Mm. And uh, so he was an ex-military and he went to see a stonemason, and the stonemason taught him how to clean graves. And he goes down to the Falkland Islands, and he cleans the graves down there of his fallen comrades. I think that was just amazing, that story. So we're going to sing this song, this hymn, this lovely hymn, To God Be the Glory. Great things he has done. Nothing to do with us. So loved he the world that he gave us. He gave us the very thing that was most precious to him very person, that, and that was his own son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin mm. and opened the life gate. That's the open the door so that we can Come enter on. in. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, Tom. We're in G. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he loved he gave us his son.
marching out. The Lord is marching out in splendor. In awesome majesty he rides. Watch in humility and justice. The army, army fills the sky. Oh, give thanks to the Lord.
two years ago, I was uh, running downhill in the rain, running to catch a train down a quite a, a narrow cobble, uh, cobbled lane in, in Newcastle. And I got my feet caught in these one of these uh, plastic strips that they bind things together with, and the strip hadn't been cut. And I got one foot caught in it, and then the other foot got caught in it, and I went down like a stone. I just went smack, and then I slid. And I literally stopped an inch from the main road, the busy main road. And uh, I lay there thinking, I think I've broken something, and I had. And this man came along, he must have been seven foot tall, and he had bright red hair, and he had a, like a Scottish accent. And he picked me up and he said, I've got you, I've got you, I'm holding you. And you know, I think that was an angel. The experience was incredible got myself to hospital and I had a broken shoulder but I was picked up that day by what I know to be an angel in the pouring rain in Newcastle and it's to God he deserves the glory you deserve the glory and the honor Lord, I lift my hands before you to glorify your name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. Just reach out and pull it down and just, you know, reach your arms up. Pull it down from heaven and put it, apply it to your heart. Because God's here for you this morning, this afternoon. God's here for you. He's here just for you. He's not here for us. He's here for you. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. For you are great.
Father, there is no one else like you. You are almighty God. And you sent your son, your one and only son, to save us. And we owe you all the honor and the glory and the praise and the thanks. And what you have done for us is immeasurable. And we worship you this afternoon. We thank you that you save us and you keep us. And you watch over us. And you guide us. And you love us. And you will never stop. Because you're the eternal God. The eternal Father. And the eternal Saviour. And we thank you, Lord, that we can stop at a moment like this on a day of remembrance for people who've died in past wars and still mm -hmm. suffer today. And we want to take our moment to just stop and to remember the price paid for our freedom. So I'll ask Kevin, could you come forward and, and then we'll have a, a two minutes silence, a time of remembrance. We take time to remember and thank God for the men and women who served in the First and the Second World Wars and conflicts since. Many who have served have obeyed and carried out orders they have affected their lives and their, their fam of their families and themselves for many years. We pray for all those currently serving in the armed forces, for their families, that God would speak to them in a way they would recognise God's love for them. So we'll take two minutes. We remember them. We've paused for two minutes to remember that they gave their whole lives for us. And we also pray for all those who still carry the, the scars, the mental and the physical scars of conflict today. We pray that they will find your healing and your peace in their lives. Father, you 
are merciful and gracious. You've been merciful to this nation over the ages. And we just thank you, Lord, in, in these perilous times that we will know your care and your mercy for ourselves, our families, our loved ones, our nation. Thank you, Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. people go by the cenotaph today. What did you see? Amongst the younger men and women that were passing by, in the forefront as it were, but when it got back to those who have been retired quite a time, and also amongst some that were wounded, it's very interesting to see how they are helped along. And especially towards the latter end of people, the number of men and women that were helped along. And those are the things we don't often notice. Will you come here a minute, brother? Again, sorry. <laughs> And so, as they were marching, somebody that couldn't march very well, no, well then, hold on. they were like that, that's right. And so they were marching in line. This man was helping this man. Same with the women. Many elder people being pushed in wheelchairs People are getting older. Did you know you are getting older? You are getting older. So make the best of today. And where we can help each other, that is God's plan. I don't know how this one, uh, I would have got on if I hadn't had this man with me, marching along. I'm talking about the men and women that were there. And friends, these things, we, we just need to observe those Observe what we are seeing. I'm encouraging you to see what you're looking at. Because so many times, so many people wouldn't see those kind of things. I am a little bit more observant as I get older. And so I am seeing more and more people today, as I've been watching there, more and more people having to help each other to keep in line for one thing, but also to keep in that batch of people that they're in as part of that group. And so, all I'm saying today is, this is my sermon for today. What are you seeing? What are you seeing in Northland High Street? What are you seeing in Thirsk High Street? What are you seeing with, with the odd person that is not getting on very well. Hey, whilst we've still got two hands and two feet and two eyes, we may find ourselves realizing that God is showing us a little bit more about how we could maybe open that door for that person there. Into Barker's, no, never bother about Barker's, go for a, a coffee. <laughs> Know what I mean? Oh, friends, hey, going to cost you a bit more of this. There are plenty of people. There's the, there's the person that stands trying to sell a magazine. That lady in Thirsk, she has three children to look after at home. And the husband's walked out on her. And what do you get from the National Health? There's another lass outside at this end, at Northallerton. Just stop, have a word with them. 
Don't say, look after yourself. No, just share a bit. Don't bother to take the magazine if you don't want to read it. Come on, church. Let's get our eyesight better before we can't see at all. Amen. Dear brother, you are going to be sharing for us today. What are you doing now, please? I will. Welcome. <laughs> Give him a clap, folks. Well, that will be a faith clap then, because you don't know what I'm going to say. Well, I'm talking about revelations about Jesus today, uh, because in the times that we live in, if there's one place that we need to be looking, it is we need to be looking at Jesus. I'm going to pray. Thank you, Father, that you want us to truly know you and your Son, who you sent. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, whom you have sent to lead us into all truth. And so I pray that this afternoon, the Holy Spirit, you do that. Open our spiritual eyes, open our spiritual ears that we may see more of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Amen. Uh, recently, <coughs> Heather and I were in, in Thirsk, and we wanted to get a cup of coffee, and we went into a... Uh, Jim mentioned coffee, so I thought I'd pick up on that theme. <coughs> Um, we went in to get a cup of coffee, and we went to this show. It wasn't, wasn't very busy. We found a seat, and we sat down, and uh, there was somebody serving, and they were going backwards and forwards. Um, and, and we sat there, and they didn't come to us, and, and it, was all, it all seemed a bit strange. And they walked past us several times, and we thought... Uh, and then they disappeared, and we could hear there were other people out the back, because we could hear conversation. And we sat there, and we thought... We're not going to get coffee anytime soon here, so we decided we'd uh, we'd go somewhere else. Now I know some of you are probably thinking, "Oh, I think the Lord is teaching you patience." <laughs> <coughs> uh, well, that that's highly possible. Yes, yes, that can always happen, but th th that isn't the point I'm going to make this this afternoon. Uh, so we went to another another place and. Uh, this time I managed to order the coffee and, uh, and paid for it and went and sat down. And again, there were a few people in there. There were, there were three people serving and they obviously knew a lot of the people and they were regulars and they were going out chatting to them all. And, and we waited and we waited and then eventually the, the, the coffee came and uh, it was cold. Well, it was <laughs> lukewarm. So, so anyway, we didn't, we didn't throw a hissy fit or anything like that. We just drank up and left. But, but there was something about all of those things that it just struck me. There was, there was something going on that I needed to, uh, needed to understand. And, and what I realized is that people can get, we can all get so distracted by what's going on in our lives and, and around us and in the world that we can forget the main thing. That, that saying that remember to make the main thing the main thing. Now, for a coffee shop, the main thing is to serve coffee to customers. Now, I'm not saying that you know, there are other things that go on. Um, but there's, there's an application for the church as well here, as I thought about this. It, it was a picture. And that is that there is a main thing for the church. With all the things that the church can and does do, the main thing is to know Jesus and to make him known. That is the main thing. So in all the things that we do, we want it to point to our Saviour in one way and another, whether it's through acts of kindness, whether it's speaking at a pulpit, whatever it is, that 
people understand it's because of Jesus, the Saviour of the world. And God gave us this, this book, 66 books really, and, and this book, the central theme of this book is Jesus, the Saviour of the world. All of these books have been written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with that, with that common theme to reveal God's Son, our Saviour, to us so that we would receive him and embrace him in our lives. Yeah. On the road to Emmaus, um, there are two disciples. This is straight after Jesus was crucified and been buried. And these two disciples, they were walking to Emmaus from Jerusalem. They were discouraged and they were confused. Discouraged because they thought, well, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's been crucified. And also, they were hearing reports that some people had seen him alive. So, they, what were they to make of that? And Jesus comes up to them, not revealing himself. You can read all about him in, in uh, Luke 24. And he gives them a Bible study. And he says... How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to enter these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It's all about Jesus in here. That when we read this with that perspective, assisted by the Holy Spirit, show me Jesus in these passages I'm reading, whether it's Old Testament or whether it's New Testament. He's all throughout there. Now, our well-known verse, John 3.16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And Jesus explains to us what eternal life is. In his prayer in John 17, in verse 3, he says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, the one true God, and his Son, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life isn't anything to do with time. It's all to do with relationship. It's about knowing God the Father and knowing his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is to know, not just know about these days, with so much information out there, you can know about a lot of people and still not know them. But God's heart is that we would know him in a deep and a powerful and a personal way. That is his desire. In Matthew 16, we have that, that passage when Jesus comes to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he throws out a question to the disciples. And he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, who do they say I am? And they come up with various answers. But then he brings it down to the next question, which is, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? That is the biggest and the most important question in human history. And our answer to that question determines our eternal destiny. Will it be with God forever in eternity? Or will it be in another place of eternal destruction? It hinges on our answer to that question. Do we, do we realise how passionate God the Father is about his son. We might think, well, God the Father, he's God, and, but he's passionate about his son. One way I, I like to describe what God has done, this is very, a very simplistic thing, but God the Father created a kingdom for his son and he sent the Holy Spirit to find a bride for him. You are that bride. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Saviour, you are the bride of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. 
What a wonderful thing to be part of the bride of Christ. Whether you're great or whether you're least, it doesn't make any difference. If you believe in Jesus, you're part of the bride. In the Old Testament, it's full of what are called types and shadows, pictures, pictures of the Lord Jesus. And one of the, the most beautiful pictures is the picture of Joseph, Jacob's favourite son. He was rejected by his brothers, they wanted to get rid of him, but then in the end, he actually saves them, effectively saving the whole of the, of the nation of Israel, because he saves all of his family from fam perishing in a great famine. What a picture of Jesus. Jesus, rejected by his own people. They wanted to get rid of him. And yet he will come back at the end of the tribulation and he will save his people Israel. What a picture. And the Old Testament is full of things like that. Uh, there's that mysterious character, Melchizedek who turns up in uh, Genesis 14 after Abraham, or he was Abraham at that time, had just come back from rescuing his, uh, his nephew Lot. And this person, Melchizedek, comes out to meet him. And this is what it says in Hebrews about Melchizedek. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the son of God, he remains a priest forever. It's a picture of Jesus. And that... And I can believe, because some people say, well, it is actually Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. But just before I get to that, there's another beautiful thing that goes with the Melchizedek story, and that is that in Genesis 14, it says that Melchizedek, Melchizedek, how we want to say it, comes out with bread and wine. What, do, what does that remind us of? Communion the Last Supper, and Jesus served his disciples bread and wine. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, just a very simple thing, that when we have a time of communion, when we come forward, let's not see the servers serving us bread and wine. Let's picture Jesus Hallelujah. serving us bread and wine. That's a whole different order of things. That as we come forward, we see Jesus himself serving us bread and wine. That's a, that's a wow moment. And there are appearances of, of Jesus in the Old Testament, what they call pre-incarnate appearances. <coughs> we could think of Abraham when three visitors in Genesis 18. They, they come to, he's, he's outside his tent in Mamre, and these three visitors arrive. And when, when you read that account, you can read that the name Lord comes time again. Abraham says, Lord, to this person, these three visitors. And it's the time when... Uh, Sarah finds she's going to have this promised child, the child of the promise, Isaac. And, and it's also before uh, these, this person speaks to Abraham about what's going to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, it's Jesus, because if you read it and you, you, you read the language, the middle person is Jesus appearing <coughs> in the Old Testament. And the other two were... Were, I believe were angels and I think it's those two angels are the ones that went into Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot so Jesus shows up in the Old Testament and then we could think of Jacob 
when he's wrestling with a man at Penal. Penal means the face of God. He said, I've seen God face to face. So who is that? That's Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Now, people might think, well, hang on a minute, how, how can that be? How, he, he's not even been born yet. How can Jesus show up in the Old Testament when he's not been born? Well, the answer is that we live in this thing called time that God created. He created time and he put us in it. And it's got days, it's got weeks, it's got months, it's got years. But God doesn't live in time, he lives in eternity, which is a different realm altogether. He's the creator God, he created time. When he looks into time from eternity, he sees into the future with the same clarity that we can look back into the past. Because time, to him, is something he created, and he can see it all in one go. I haven't got any problem believing that creator God who created time can choose to just step into time at whatever point he what chooses to. Because he is God. He's creator God. And there, there's a couple of instances that, that bring out that, that God has got the power over time. There's a, a passage in the book of Joshua. I'll, I'll read it because when you, when you think about what actually happened, it, uh, it blows your fuse box. Well, you did mine. In, in Joshua 10, Joshua is fighting the Amorites and he, he basically wants more time to complete the job. And so he, he, he says to the Lord, in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ayalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nations avenged itself on its enemies. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. That is awesome. <laughs> we think about the sun stopped. That means the earth stopped spinning. Now, what happens if the earth stops spinning? I googled it. What happens if the earth stops spinning? <laughs> and do you know you can get an answer? And basically, the answer is catastrophe. Everything that we know would literally just fall apart, disintegrate. The scientists don't really know how bad it would be. They just know it would be catastrophic. Yeah. Another little did you know thing that I discovered. If you stand on the equator, because of the speed that the Earth rotates, you're traveling at 1,000 miles an hour. Yeah. Tuck that in your pocket for the next quiz night. <laughs> just imagine, 1,000 miles an hour, and suddenly it stops. So there's an extra day there. There's also another, probably a half day, when Hezekiah is ill, and he's about to die, and he prays to God, I don't want to die, and God hears his prayer and sends Isaiah to see him. And Isaiah goes and tells him, God's heard your prayer, he's going to give you another 15 years, and uh, Hezekiah, Hez, he wanted a confirmation. He said, give, give me a sign that I know this is going to happen, that I'm going to recover. And, and he basically asked for the shadow not to go forward 10 steps like it normally would, but it would go back 10 steps. And that probably equates to about another half a day, where then God presumably rotated the earth backwards for a while before he put it forwards again. There's one and a half days extra in the timeline of human history that can't be explained by science, but it's in here. Yes. Because God is God, he's the eternal creator, and he created time, and he can do these things. I'm saying all these things for us to get, to realise how awesome God is. And even as awesome as he is, how personal he becomes with each of us. 
like his love is universal, but his love is personal as well. And there are other revelations of Jesus in the Old Testament. King of righteousness, king of peace, commander of the Lord's army. But let, let's move into the New Testament, which is uh, perhaps less controversial ground, although I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, let's start with those verses at the beginning of the book of John. Uh, and this, this is John's parallel to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the word... And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So the creator enters his own creation. Isn't, isn't that, there aren't, I don't think there's a vocabulary that can really capture that. Who would ever have dreamt that God would enter his own creation, born a baby through, through a woman, by a woman, to grow up as a child like we all do and become a man and experience everything that we do as human beings. That creator God would do that. He would squeeze himself into human form. He would put aside all his divine privileges, his glory and his power and his honour, and he would become a human being for our sakes. Yeah. And that leads into the next thing I wanted to point out. And it's, and it's when Mary and Joseph take the baby Jesus after the time of purification into the temple in Jerusalem. And in the temple is Simeon is waiting. And he's been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not die, he would not leave planet Earth until he had seen the Lord's Christ. What a wonderful promise. And he's moved by the Holy Spirit when Mary and Joseph come in with Jesus. He's moved by the Spirit to go in and he's, this is it, this is him. And he can say, he then there's a lovely little bit where he says, you can now dismiss me in peace. Because my eyes have seen your salvation. I've seen what you promised. And this is the, the bit that is so beautiful. He takes the baby Jesus in his arms. The created, holding the creator, cradling him, him in his arms. What a moment. I, I, I can only wonder how Simeon felt at that moment. He was holding God in his arms. And of course, Anna's there in the temple as well, and she talks about Jesus being the great redeemer, the redemption of Israel. And so then we think about the Magi, who they come. Where is this child who is king of the Jews? Jesus is king of the Jews. And at his baptism, the voice from heaven, God the Father, he speaks from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father gives a confirmation that Jesus is the son of God, God the Son. And then we think about the triumphal entry. When People are rejoicing and celebrating. Hosanna to, uh, to the son of David. In other words, they're saying, the Lord Jesus, Jesus as he comes, he is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. And that's why all the religious people get upset. And he is. In fact, if you look at Matthew's gospel, it starts with the genealogy of Abraham, and it goes through King David, and right through, and it, the whole purpose is to show to the Jews, the people of Israel, that Jesus is legitimately, legally, the rightful heir to the throne of Israel, the throne of David. It's written deliberately like that, to show there is a legal proof that Jesus, born 
of a woman through that lineage, he is the rightful king of Israel. And he will come back, establish his throne in Jerusalem, rule and reign for a thousand years as the king of Israel. And then we've got Thomas. Thomas who doubts. He can't believe the stories he's hearing that Jesus is alive. He saw him crucified and now he can't believe that Jesus could really be raised from the dead. And Jesus graciously removes his doubt. Such, such a... This, this is the Son of God who doesn't beat up Thomas for doubting. He graciously removes his doubt. Stick your, stick your finger in here. Stick your hand in here. Stop doubting. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He got his proof. That is our gracious saviour. Let me read these words of, from Hebrews, which are a, they're a description of the Lord Jesus to Jewish background believers. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And he will inherit all things. And through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Again, there's, a, there's another verse you can give to somebody who says, well, what is God like? Look at Jesus. He is exactly like the Father. There is no difference between God the Son and God the Father, between Jesus. If you want to know what Jesus is like, how God is, then read the Gospels. Then you'll start to see. You'll start to understand. That's our loving, gracious God. And it goes on, sustaining all things by his powerful word. You know, Jesus is holding everything together by his word in the universe. If, if he stopped holding th all things together, if he stopped sustaining it by his word, the universe would just fall apart, literally. That is the power of the Saviour's word. One word from the Lord Jesus changes everything. One word, total authority of the Saviour. He said, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The Lord Jesus has the authority. If we've got a need, he has the authority to meet that need. Getting off track there a bit. <laughs> after, he, um, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Angels are awesome. But Jesus is above that. Greater than any, any angel. Let's have a, just look at some of the things in, in Revelation as we try and sort of gather this all together. Now John has this, this vision, and it's the Lord Jesus, and it's an overwhelming vision of the Lord Jesus. So overwhelming, it says that he fell at his feet as though dead. The, the glory was so great, so heavy, it just put him on the ground. But then in Revelation 1, verse 17, this is Jesus speaking to him. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
He was there at the beginning and he'll be there at the end. He is the living one. He died, he was buried, and he's come back to life again, conquering the power of death for us. He was eternal, but became a human being for our sakes to break the power of death for us and release us from the fear of death. Death was never God's idea for man. It was the result of sin. And he's got the keys of death and Hades. He's got the authority over death and hell. Authority again. And then you get the seven letters to the churches. And these are letters that Jesus writes to the churches. And he introduces himself in a different way to each church. It's interesting. So like for Ephesus... He introduced himself as the one who's got angel, holds angels in his hands. Again, that speaks of his authority, his greatness. And then Pergamum, he's got the double-edged sword. That speaks of him as judge. And when Jesus judges, it will be with perfect justice. There'll be no grounds for appeal, no case for mistrial, no, that's not fair, you haven't taken this into account, none of that. As the perfect judge, he will judge with perfect justice. Uh, Thyatira, son of God. In other words, glorious. If Jesus were to show up now and reveal himself in his full glory, we'd be all flat on the floor. I, I'm not sure that we'd be able, actually be able to take it. I don't think we'll be able to stand glory until we get our resurrection body. Because humanly speaking, we're just not up to the glory. So I, I think what God does, he gives us little, he, like he lifts, he lifts the curtain just a little bit to just give us a little look and what we see is just glorious, wonderful. And then Philadelphia, holy and true. In other words, perfect. Our saviour is perfect. And another word that, that, that I, I really like to use is integrity. Integrity is in short supply in the world today. <coughs> But Jesus is perfect in integrity. There is nothing false about him. N no no backs, backside to him. No second side to him that we're not sure about. <coughs> he is perfect in every way. And then Laodicea, he says he's the amen. In other words, Jesus has the last word. There's a lot of people like to have the last word, have you noticed? But Jesus, Jesus is the one who has the last word. Yeah. He is the amen. And then we get to that passage where the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19. I saw heaven standing open and before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That is Jesus. And goes on to say, his name is the word of God. That is Jesus. And it ends up with, on his robe and on his thighs, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is above all kings. He is above all lords. He is above everything. He is perfect in all his ways. He is glorious. He's majestic. He's wonderful. He's lovely. He's beautiful. He's adorable. He is everything and every one you would ever want. And this, this is our saviour. So coming back to that question that Jesus Ask the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And so he is. And he still is today. So if you need salvation today, he is still saviour today. The offer is still there today. But as I prepared, I, I knew I wasn't to end there because there's a part of a verse I read out, uh, John 1, 14. I only read the first bit because the second part of that verse. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That was the bit I read out. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's the grace thing, the grace of God. We are saved by grace through faith. And it's all a gift. Even the faith to believe is a gift. There is nothing for us to, to boast about except the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives it all to us. The Son of God became Son of Man for us. And in the Gospels, the, the title that Jesus uses about himself more than anything else is Son of Man. The Creator identified, him, identified himself with the created to save us. God stood in our shoes to save us from judgment and being separated and cut off from him forever. So he came and did what we could never do, which is save ourselves. So he came, stood in our shoes to take our judgment so that we could be reconciled to God and share eternity with him. So I wanted to close by reading a couple of bits from Isaiah 53, which is the most detailed prophetic word that describes exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. So Isaiah 53, verse 4 through to 6. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, Yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the cross. And this is the result. Last half of verse 12. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That is what Jesus did for us. He put aside his glory, his majesty, his holiness. He put all that aside. He took on the form of man, stepped into our shoes, went through that, that abuse. That's not a big enough word. To break the power of all that the world can throw at us and go to the cross to die our death so that we can be raised to new life in him when he came up out of the grave. And now he's at the right hand of the Father. He's made a way for mankind to follow him into heaven. He's our great high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father. We only have to say, Father, I put my trust in in your Son, my Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father says, welcome child. You are totally accepted, just as my Son is accepted. You are accepted in the same way.
And just as, as he is sitting at the Father, he seats us in the heavenly realms with him. Spiritually, that's where we, we already are as children of God. And one day we will actually be there. So, I'm going to make a, just make an appeal. If there's anybody listening, anybody watching, you have never understood who Jesus is and what he has done for you. Today is the day when you can simply say, Lord Jesus, I want you and I accept you as my Lord and my Saviour. Come into my life. Make me new. And you can be born again today. And you will begin a new life. I think now would be a good time to worship. Worship our Saviour. Father, we can only imagine the cost to you to hand over your beloved son into the hands of sinful men. We can only imagine the pain you must have felt. And that on the cross you had to turn away from your own son for the first time as he carried our sins. But we thank you, Father, that you were willing to do that and that, Lord Jesus, you would pay that amazing price to bring us home, to be with you forever and to be considered a bride. We are lost in wonder, love and praise at what you have done for us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's still true today. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. We bless you. We worship you. Only you could do it, but you have done it. We bless you, Lord. Amen.